BioBalance HealthCast episode 206, The Physiology of Sex. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Dr. Kathy Maupin, and this is Brett Newcomb, and we're here to talk about your favorite subject. We're going to talk about sex and everything that we've ever been asked about sex and everything actually that we know about sex in a clinical way and uh, hopefully in a, in a professional way so that we're not embarrassing too much of our listeners or, or our, ourselves. ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> but this is the same thing I talk about every day, all day long in my office. You really do. And it, it's interesting to listen to you talk about that as a, as a clinician dealing with marital couples or relationship issues. Sex is also is always a, a significant contributor to tensions and, and issues. Mm-hmm. Or no sex is uh, contributor. But, but in my experience, <laughs> people are very reluctant to be detail specific about the mechanics of sex, mm-hmm. uh, the, and and so they they struggle to get the message out about what the problem might be as mm-hmm. they see it. But what you tell me is that people come in and talk very specifically, very readily mm-hmm. about the mechanics of what's working or not working. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, one of the things we'll talk about I need about to know that. Is, I mean, that's the, something that I need. I have to know to, to help them. Right. I mean, we've talked before on some of these podcasts about there being sort of three points of origin for female orgasms. And we've talked about female ejaculation. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I ever ha- – I, I had maybe one or two clients who could talk about the the issue of the location of orgasm. I, I had one client I remember that could not have an orgasm while being penetrated by mm-hmm. her husband. Uh, and so they had to learn that that was not a failure of performance or concern on his part uh, about which either or both of them would be hurt or angry. He wasn't doing something yes. right. They, they had to learn that her body – was different and that it would respond more to clitoral stimulation or masturbation than to uh, penetrative sex. Mm -hmm. So that couple did talk about those things specifically and what their uh, communications issues and adaptive responses were. But typically people don't. In in my business, they talk more about uh, frustrations of communication and failures in intimacy that occur in the sexual domain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so we'll talk we'll, we'll about some of that, about that today as well. as well. And I want to reassure the people who are my patients <laughs> who listen to this that we only talk in generalities. We had never attach. And this is a composite. This is a composite. Yeah. Ever attach anything that's said in my office or in his office with a with a person. We talk about no, that would be cases. Yeah. And this was said or this happened or you know, and even the the funny stories we talk about have no names attached. Mm-hmm. So, and not enough information that anyone could actually recognize someone. So, I don't want you to think that we would ever violate your confidentiality, which would ruin the ability of me to diagnose and you to tell me everything you needed to tell me. So, having said that, yeah, then we can go on because I certainly don't want to think anyone would think that I would tell anyone, and I usually don't write any of that down. Right. on a chart either because in general it's not significant for diagnosis except for me and I can make the diagnosis without giving any details in writing mm-hmm. and I, I'm sure that that's not true of everyone but I don't find that to be something that anyone should have in writing because your insurance company gets your chart right why should they know any of that so well, that's one I'm very protective to be that. very discreet in our uh, written or subpoenaable documentation mm-hmm. to protect somebody's privacy. Because I don't want someone to know anything about that. You know, one <laughs> one time I had seen a, a psychologist because I had per- a particularly, actually a psychiatrist, a particularly difficult time in residency because they weren't used to women, okay? And they didn't really think we should be there back then. Right. And this is just an aside, but it's important to know that I was home after I had my baby, and I had gone to the psychiatrist before I had my baby, and I'm flipping through channels, and there she is on television. She didn't say my name, but she gave most of the details the that anyone who knew me could have actually 
watched that and known it was me. Yeah. And from that moment on, I went, that's never how I'm going to give a case study. You don't no. give any kind of information that would identify No, you're the trained person. not to. I mean, right. I don't think that she was very young, but she, she, she helped me. Yeah. And I, I never even told her that I saw that. But having said that, I don't want to do that to someone else because I know it felt very invasive. Yeah. So now we're back to our subject. <laughs> so part of this uh, decision to do this, I mean, we've done, if you look back over our list of more than 200 podcasts, we've done several that have conversational focuses or foci on uh, sex, intimacy, orgasm, male, female, what have you. We, uh, in a couple months ago had done a webinar, a live webinar where people could watch and send in questions and so on, on the factors of sex and intimacy and orgasm and intimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, so, and testosterone and hormones. And all the hormonal, physiological, psychological components of that. So as a result of that webinar, we decided that perhaps it would be useful to do a series of podcasts or healthcasts once again on elements of that that concerned the people that we were talking to or that our research and preparation for that uh, had revealed. For instance, things statistically have changed over the last several years. In, in doing the research for the webinar, we found uh, a, a research report that said people who cohabitate uh, under the age of 35 now report having an average of a sex, uh, sexual experiences 11 to 13 times a month. Married couples average 11.7 times a month between 19 and 24, ages 19 and 24, 8.5 times a month between 30 and 34, 5.5 times a month uh, between 50 and 54, 2.4 times a month, 65 to 69, and 0.8 times a month, 75 and older. And I'm planning on changing those numbers. Yeah. I mean, making them much more. As you age, the sexual frequency. <laughs> better at a higher age. Goes down. And there are a lot of reasons for that, especially in those older uh, age cohorts, 60 to 75 to 80. Some of that is due to the fact that, that people die. Uh, or people are divorced, and at that age they're without partners to have sex with. Uh, mm -hmm. So th they may count masturbation. I mean, I mean some of the, the difficulty in asking about all of this is how you define sex. Right. Uh, I remember there was a president once who said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. And what he was talking about is he didn't have penetrative uh, sex. Mm -hmm. And so the question of what constitutes sexual act, sexual behavior, is part of the definition process mm -hmm. you have to go through. And I'm not sure how they defined that in that study. I am not either. I mean, it doesn't say. It just I would say sex. it was probably intercourse. And it was, they were couples. Right. So they. Who were married or who, who lived together. Who, right. And so it was, had to have people who lost a partner taken out of the study. It would yes. have had to. Yes. So it had to be people who were actually living together and who were having, who I guess were having sex or weren't having sex, mm -hmm. but they had to look at each one of those age groups and people who would actually respond. So we're losing some people who are embarrassed to say they have sex every day, and we're, we're embarrassed to say they never had sex. Well, and so, you don't know the research. Is it a survey that people fill out from pre-established mm -hmm. questions? so that they interpret for themselves what that means? Mm -hmm. Or is it an interview where you can qualify the information and say, are you talking about this or that or the other? So every time you look at a statistic, you have to kind of think, hmm, there's a fudge factor because you're yeah. not exactly sure who did it, how they did it, how compulsive they were. I find that to be a trend. That's a trend that makes sense to me because people get ill, become ill, two people in a partnership, if someone's ill, we get more ill as we get older, unfortunately. If one person in a, in a marriage or a partnership gets becomes ill, well, there goes your sex life, basically, yeah. oftentimes. Right. Not always. But so that decreases the amount of sex you would have. Well. I mean, even, you know, like my husband had a knee operation. I mean, okay, so that makes it real difficult to do anything if somebody's in pain or if they're, you know, right. that kind of, you just turn that switch off for a while. Right, and so if they're in chronic, long-lasting, enduring pain, that's... It would take quite a person to get through that and still yeah. have sex that they wanted to have, mm -hmm. unless they were just trying to please somebody, and we'll talk about that, too. Yeah. But, so there's a reason besides just testosterone, 
that as we get older, we have less sex. There's also a reason why the 19 to 20 somethings will have more sex than people cohabiting after that. And that's because there's a lot of kids around, <laughs> you know, so yeah. it's, it's not just, it's not just your social situation or your health situation or your testosterone or it, it's all these things combined in America's American society. But one of the things that they quoted that I thought was very interesting and I was shocked is that Americans have more sex in this study than Greeks. Mm-hmm. Who knew? I mean, yeah. I thought Greeks were very highly sexed. You know that, uh, and the, I guess the people who had the least amount of sex were Asians yeah. in in Japan. And I don't mean American Asians. I mean Asians who were who live in Japan and Indonesia, Japanese and Chinese, and which Indonesian. I have no good explanation for. I think there are some studies that show that testosterone receptor sites are lower in Asians than are in other uh, races hmm. and that the testosterone levels are lower. So it may be that, or maybe they're so smart they're just doing other things. Well, so let's talk about the elements. I mean, let's try to break it down a little bit. There are physiological processes that are required for sex to be possible or to happen at mm-hmm. all and to happen with a satisfactory conclusion. I mean, there, there are elements of all three of those things. Mm-hmm. And then there are psychological ingredients that are personal and cultural. Yes. So let's talk about the physiological components okay. of desire, arousal, flirting, uh, mm-hmm. erection, sex, orgasm, mm-hmm. and separate it out that way. And then we'll talk about the psychological, cultural stuff. Well, in all of my research, desire is really a chemical and available opportunity mm-hmm. kind of thing. Now, people have a what we call a libido. That's a desire for sexuality and having sex, but it's also the thoughts of sex, the the fantasies of sex, dreams of sex, um, sex as a, as a motivation, like, okay, so I want to come home early from this party so that I can have sex. I mean, it's a motivator as well. So, so all of these things have to do with the chemical testosterone, the hormone testosterone. Mm-hmm. And that is the driver for many motivational things, but mostly it was really most likely built to propagate the planet, to cause humans to want to have sex. So testosterone, with testosterone, people want to have sex more. It doesn't mean you have sex more, but it gives you more thoughts, more ability to think about planning, negotiating how to find a partner, how to find how to get your partner to respond to you. It's it's a push basically, but it is a chemical push. And I see this all the time in yes. people. Yes. I mean, I see people who come in and say, and, and you can have low testosterone levels your whole life. Well, I have people who say, like women will come in and say, well, I was on the pill my whole life, and then I went through menopause, and I never really had a sex drive, and mm, I've never had or- an orgasm. They say very embarrassed because they're, they are embarrassed about this, but they never really wanted to have sex. They did it as an obligation to their spouse, and they wanted to make them happy. But but when we gave them testosterone back, <laughs> they, they come in and, I mean, every once in a while they'll be really serious and say, you know, it, it worked. It, you know, instead of going, ah, you know, I expect them to kind of come in and go, it worked. Oh my gosh, you can't believe it. But, but testosterone made the difference. Right. It was, and that's just, that's a chemical in your body that makes a difference that makes it possible for you to want sex, possible for you to have sex and possible for you to have an orgasm. Absolutely. All of those elements are in that. And so if, as you age, you lose testosterone, mm-hmm. then as you age, you should expect uh, that you're thinking about sex. I mean, even to just like have the idea pop into your head. As you, mm-hmm. you know, if you walk past somebody and you look at them and go, oh, that looks nice, uh, <laughs> that can be an, an objective. That's a guy thought. Oh, That's, is, that is. Is it truly? Yeah. Because I hear women say that as well. Well, women look at men and admire them and but but, I doesn't mean, mean, but we don't go. Oh, that's nice. I mean, that's just a kind of a, the way you said it was more. Okay. We, we go. Oh, he's no, so I, it's handsome. Interesting that you or say oh, that. he looks so. I mean, there there are, are guys that are just charismatic. What is that? That's pheromones. Huh. 
Uh-huh. That's pheromones and the confidence pheromones give you. And co- pheromones come from testosterone. So, yeah, we look at those guys and we go, oh, you know, James Bond. My, my wife is in love <laughs> with Adam Levine. And, and I have to be grateful for the fact that the guy's not around. <laughs> Really? Yeah. I like to fall asleep in 007 movies. He's he's one of those men that triggers something in her that makes Mm -hmm. her perk up. And she's, you know, open enough to admit that, perhaps because she knows she's never going to be around him. Uh, Otherwise, she might be a little more cautious. She probably wouldn't tell you about the people in in your lives that that make her. I suspect not. Yeah, Yeah. that would probably be somewhat of a secret. Those would be, yeah. And you don't need to share everything. Problematic. (laughs) <laughs> but but what Kathy's talking about is the cognitive process that says to you, oh, sex might be interesting, or that's sensual, that's stimulating, is driven in some measure by the amount of testosterone that your body has. If it doesn't have enough, you're not going to have those thoughts. You're going to walk right by those opportunities that might in the past They're have, invisible. have said, hey, let's do something. I mean, I've been there with no testosterone, but, and, but it's also, and it's they're invisible. You don't yeah. even... Yeah, you think about it. it. You're thinking about something else. And, and it's also a little bit hierarchical, depending on where your testosterone level is. You may be out to dinner or at a movie or a theater or something and look at your partner and think, you know, I'm feeling good. When we go home tonight, maybe we'll have sex. Mm-hmm. And by the time you get home, that is so far away from your awareness and so far away from your consciousness that it might as well never have happened. Mm-hmm. In part because you've moved on, but also in part because your partner didn't have that information, didn't get to act on that information, didn't get to have any experience of their own. And should they signal you when we get mm-hmm. into the, the, the biomechanical mm-hmm. aspects of cueing, mm-hmm. you know, if they are flirting with you, if they're giving you the look or if they're m- most couples develop rituals by which they signal one another that they're interested in or open to mm-hmm. some sexual encounter. And so I'm signaling and flagging and, and ritualizing all I want and, <laughs> My wife doesn't have any testosterone. She's going to be checking the kids, planning the dinner, doing the laundry, mopping the floor. And all my signals are for naught. Uh, So one of the issues that in my business we get into is the whole question of the ability to communicate about those things in a a non-aggressive, non-threatening way where someone is not at fault, but we can talk about, okay, this is what seems to be happening. How do we understand what we do about it? You know, it's so interesting. Sex is so complicated. I mean, I work with that. If you're looking at it like the food pyramid, I'm I'm working at I'm looking at it like you have to basically have a level of testosterone to even put it on the plate, put it into your brain. Yeah. So it's the plate that it goes on. So it's a place. Yeah. You you need to have that at the very base. Right. That's a requirement. If you don't have that, then everything else on top of it isn't going to work. But on top of that is our own social experience. Did we see our parents flirt? Did we learn that? Right. I mean, it's best if your children do see you flirt so they understand what's what they don't know what that really means, but and they know that that's a touch. loving thing yeah. that you do. But if your parents never did that, that's something you have to go ahead and learn. Mm-hmm. Sometimes a partner can teach you that. Sometimes somebody you dated in the past before you find your partner taught you that. But it's a learning experience if you didn't just learn it as a child. So then there's this social basis, and there's all these things that can go wrong in all of these yeah. things. But basically, that happens. Then you have to find a desirable partner. I mean, some people are really picky. Some people are not. I mean, it's one of those things where even if you have testosterone, if you don't find somebody that really turns that hits that button – then that is not going to happen for you. Mm -hmm. They may be coming up to you. They may be putting the moves on you. But if that person just doesn't trigger your pheromones, your idea of who would be a perfect mate. I mean, I grew up as one of my friends who didn't look like all the guys I dated, dating the same kind of guy. Every guy looked similar. He had dark hair and blue eyes, and he looked like this certain body type and every single guy and i just and i don't know what that was that was like a patterning early yeah so so that's that kind that gets in there is what is that type that makes us feel like we want to have sex yeah and then so many other things from there on it's everything you do with patients well and it's it is truly interesting because i i have a friend who's 
close to my age who was married for a number of years to a slender, tall, blonde woman. And they got divorced, and he started dating. And we talked about later, when, when it was safe to discuss it, uh, we talked about the fact that he only ever dated slender, tall women who became blonde if they were not blonde shortly after he started dating them. <laughs> and they all looked like his ex-wife. And I mean, he didn't. He must have somehow told them that that that's you send what they the, wanted. That's signaling. Yeah, you you do. And in some cases, specifically, when you dye your hair blonde, I think that'd be really good for you. Mm -hmm. And in other cases, so if you can't marry the they, right type, you make them look like the right type. Yes. Yeah, you do. And and that's a fascinating concept. You know, mm -hmm. we each are predetermined. Uh, somehow culturally, physiologically, mm -hmm. to be attracted to, to find certain things that are that are sexual. Uh, I used to teach anthropology, and one of the things that was always fascinating is I would show some film of primitive societies around the world. Mm -hmm. And and in that film, the people would be partially nude or fully nude. And I would tell my students, really? you won't... You showed that in high school? With permission. And parents were told, <laughs> and they signed That's amazing. Off. I never had any... Teachers that would well, not have in, at that any was rate, the dark age. Uh, with permission. But students were told, you won't find these people to be sexually attractive. It's like looking at at cattle or horses or, you know, whatever, because they are not part of your culture and what how they present themselves isn't going to trigger your sexual cueing. Because did, they don't wear makeup. Was that they true? Don't wear, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it really was. I mean, you, I mean, the first adolescent boys are going to be like, whoo! She's, you know, I see boobs, boobs yeah. <laughs> but then they stop paying attention to that and see the bigger picture and, mm -hmm. and they don't see them as sexually stimulating, like, like in a, in a movie from mm -hmm. your culture where those things would be presented in a stimulating way. Well, there, there's a book called, uh, why women have sex, which mm -hmm. is a great book by Cindy Meeson. And we've quoted her in our book. And I mean, it's, it's, opens your mind to why we choose who we choose but basically her basic theory on why we choose who we choose has to do with finding someone who is genetically different enough different that they're not your sibling that right. they're not sharing genetics yet they're enough they're familiar enough to you so they're maybe opposite in like a blonde marries a brunette or a right. dark hair right. dark eyed marries light eyed or, or something is enough different that in the old anthropologic uh, belief that you you don't want to mix genes too close because you're going to get ab abnormalities. Right. So there's a scientific basis for it, but that's what she was looking at. Is it came true now, even though it's been like this since time began. We are attracted to people who aren't genetically similar, but similar enough that we are comfortable with them. Right. So, and that's what you were talking about. Like Aboriginal people may not have they anything. They won't push those buttons. They won't push the buttons for somebody who's Northern European, you know, just for other Aboriginal people. I uh -huh. mean, it's a matter of, of what you're, you see every day, too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what your culture tells you is beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, and those things change and evolve over time. And the marketing industry is constantly trying to manipulate that. Mm -hmm. I mean, car ads are nothing but sex. And, and I talked. I told you that. Yeah. I said, you know, I've looked at cars my whole life and said, that car's beautiful. Why do I think it's beautiful? Well, it looks like you know we call cars her, mm -hmm. she. It looks like same thing with ships. Like yeah, same thing with ships. They don't look like no, no. So so like I, a um, a Porsche has beautiful hips. Men love Porsches. Huh. You know they their shape. There's a shape to the back end of a car that makes it utilitarian or makes it sexy. Yeah. And if you're looking for a luxury car that's that makes you feel macho or makes me feel sexy in it, it usually has the lines of a woman, mm -hmm. which is amazing that we haven't said that out loud in most. You know there haven't been multiple. TV shows about that, but it's true. I mean, mm -hmm. when you, oh, that Porsche, oh, my husband doesn't even fit in a Porsche. I mean, he gets in it and he's like this. And he's like, oh, but I'd love to have a Porsche. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so those, those are some of the things that change how we look at having sex, choosing a partner, using our testosterone in a positive way to have sex or why we chose the partner that we chose. Yes. And these these are just the foundation for 
more of our discussions about the physiology of sex, the sex, our sexuality in general, both psychologically and physiologically, and we'll talk more about orgasm, and we'll talk more about other um, other questions that we get all the time in the office about different like things people don't talk about at dinner parties. Well, and, and it's so difficult to have a, a, a tightly focused conversation about this because there are so many sort of free-ranging uh, sidebars. Otherwise, that, it wouldn't be interesting. <laughs> it wouldn't be interesting. But it, but it's a complex, multifaceted problem. And so we're going to have two or three more conversations about this topic as we go forward. Uh, and, and we have a lot of this in our, in our uh, book. Mm-hmm. So we are going to put uh, a portion of our book on our website. So if you go to biobalancehealth.com slash sex, then that will take you to that area of the website so that you can find that part of the book and some of the some of the um, interesting things that we have talked about today. And if you have a testimonial for us, if you go to biobalancehealth.com slash testimonials, if you have been helped by what we've said or by our book, or by testosterone, and that has changed your sex life, we would love to hear about it. As always, thank you for listening. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314 314- Nine nine three zero nine six three. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.